team. Dan, first we've had a few minutes to sort of compose yourself and think about it. How do you feel about that performance? Yeah, I feel like I showed a new um, new feather in my cap. I showed how how well rounded I am as a fighter. I made the right uh, adjustments to the game that he was doing. Like he was kind of playing his game, and he was just waiting on me for that for that first round. He'd wait for me to commit to anything, and then step through over the top with with his hands. So I just made the right adjustments and kind of just gave him a, gave him a taste of his own medicine and, and just went away from his strengths. Like if he's gonna just do that, I'm just gonna make the adjustments. I'm just Grabbed a hold of him and, and, and felt I was a lot stronger than he was. And I just used it to, to yeah, show, show how, how well-rounded I am. I know you sort of made like it's not a big deal and stuff like that, but now you've had the fight, you've won the fight. How hard has this last training camp been with the lockdown and everything like that? Oh, very crazy. This, this <laughs> like, yeah, like a bit of a bit of an undersell, but it's just been... Uh, like pretty much everything that could go wrong went wrong in this training camp. Like it was crazy, bro. To to, I signed this fight. Maybe that was like the bad thing about it. Like I signed this fight on the Sunday, and then Tuesday we went into just a full lockdown. Like everything, everything shut down. Um, but huge came up with like a, a quick plan to move everyone to the gym, and then cops come shut that down, and then I uh, trained in the gym, got caught there, cops come shut that down, and they just told me, man, we catch you doing anything one more time, and we're gonna arrest you. Um, so I was just training the last four weeks, I've just been training in my house, in my garage, um, just shadow boxing, staying sharp, uh, going to the track with my wife and my daughter for the last five weeks, so that was like, um, that was challenging getting yourself up for that, like <laughs> like getting yourself down there, working hard, pushing yourself every single day, like a couple of times of the day, working like that was, um, it was hard to get yourself up. So then when I was getting the visa issues, I was like, man, everything that I've done to get myself out of bed every single morning and push myself by myself um, to get to this moment and for you to take that from me, I'm not having it. Turn to social media, Got everyone behind me, and it's not the first time. Like, I've turned to social media uh, in the past before to get myself in the UFC in the first place. I think it was uh, harass for the hangman was the hashtag, and we used that. And I used that social media campaign to get myself in the UFC. So when I was faced with a problem I couldn't solve, I went back to the people, back to the people that got me there. Uh, you know, I don't fight for this sport New Zealand or anything like that. Like, I'll fight for the for the Kiwis back home that have my back. Those are the people that I step in the octagon for. You know, it, I'm sh you've done this a lot of times, right? You know how to fight, but after a training camp like that, where it is just yourself and shadow boxing and stuff, is there any part of you that think, man, I might not perform to the best of my abilities in there? Is there any sort of self-doubt as you head in and out to the cage? No, I feel like this last camp, um, been working with some, you know, after the last loss, and I've taken losses in the past before, um, and you know, you, you throw your toys out the cot and you start again from scratch and you like rebuild. I didn't do that this last time, you know, because I know that my team, I know how good my team is and the people who are around me. So rather than, rather than take anything away and replace it, I kept my team. I, 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 I backed them and I, I backed myself and I added some new people to the team. Uh, a couple of David Neath, like um, uh, perf mental performance coach back in New Zealand. So I, I added him and also, you know, some new looks with, with David Eagle and he's also been helping my game a lot. So I just, I added to this. I didn't take anything away because my team's incredible. I added two people, David Neath and, and David Eagle into this camp. And then post fight, could up Benil Dariush? What's the, what's the he, he's the only one sitting there without a fight. Um, if you look at the rankings, everyone's, every single last one of them's booked except Tony Ferguson and Benil Dariush. They just fought. So it doesn't make sense for that fight to happen again. So Benil Darush is sitting there without a dance partner. And that's, uh, that gets me out of bed in the morning. That gets me excited, a fight like that. Um, I like the look of his little number there. So I would love to take that off him. No interest in our man? I already got that fight. You know what I mean? You, why do you need to ask for something you already have? I already got him holding on to my pocket. I already got him. <laughs> I already got that boy chasing me around the, around the playground, if you know what I mean. Uh, there ain't no point asking for something you already got. Last thing for me. You guys have sp spoke about moving to the States. Do you have any timeline on when that might be? Oh, man, that's up to, that's up to my coaches. Uh, I'm just a body on the mat. I'm just another guy in the gym. Uh, 
it's my coaches that make all those decisions. I don't make any any of the any of the big decisions like that. Uh, at the beginning of round three, I think it, from the outside looking in, it seems like Nazareth knew he was down two rounds and probably came out guns blazing, knowing he needed the finish. And uh, the, the broadcast team maybe were wondering if you felt fatigue at all from not having not the best camp, maybe like an unstructured camp. So did you feel any fatigue set in in round three? Nah. Like, yeah, he was down two rounds. He needed to do something. And then your opportunity to do that is – in the start of that round. I, I, you know, this is not my first rodeo. I knew that that was his opportunity. I knew that that's what he was doing. So what, if I stand there and throw back, I'm giving him exactly what he wants. Like, don't be, what am I gonna do? Don't be silly. Uh, just wait till he slows down a bit. He slowed down, I grabbed a hold of him um, and worked to my strengths and, and used my advantages. And uh, on the Benil Darius, what did you make of his win over Tony Ferguson, his performance? What did, you, what did you make of Benil's performance? When was that fight? That was May, I think. Oh, man. In Houston. What, what card was that? That was uh, the Charles Oliveira. Michael. Oh, man, I was so pissed off what Michael Chandler won watching that fight back in New Zealand at my mate's house, so I can't even tell you how that fight went down. <laughs> uh, what do you think of the lightweight fight that's coming up, lightweight title fight between Poirier and Oliveira in December? Yeah, well, I feel like Poirier's, um, I feel like Poirier's got that fight. I feel like he's... Um, yeah, I feel like he's got the advantages in that fight. I feel like he gets uh, he gets it done. And what's the process of getting home? Uh, is it just you have to quarantine two weeks when you get back? Yeah, so that's why I pushed so hard to get on this card because I had a spot to get back in New Zealand. Like that's that's why I made a fight where there was no fight. Um, people got the wrong end of the stick when they saw this card and saw where I was on the card and saw who I was fighting. They were like, oh, man, the UFC's kind of disrespecting Dan Hooker after a couple of main events and a co-main event, and they've chucked him down, and it's, that's just really not how it went down. The UFC did me a solid. Sean Shelby did me a solid. Um, he created a fight where there was no fight. I pretty much just started doing interviews and was just telling everyone that I was fighting on UFC 266. <laughs> and then, like, I started telling Sean, and he, he called me, like, five weeks ago, and he's like, Dan, I don't have, like, a space on that fight. Like, I don't have an opponent. Like, there's no one in the ranks that um, can fight you. And I was just like, Sean, this has to happen. Like, this is, this is just happening. So I, I, like, willed it to happen. And I feel like if I wasn't Dan Hooker, I feel like if I haven't, I hadn't have done all the heavy lifting that I've done over the last few years for the UFC that they wouldn't have made this fight happen. So credit to Sean for, for making this fight. Credit to Nasrat for um, stepping up to the plate and, and taking a fight, which, man, last five months I've been trying to fight everyone in the rankings. They can say what they want to say, but I, <laughs> I could show you my phone with the, the emails just being like, Dan, there's no one. Dan, there's no one. Um, so actually, Nasrat just DM'd me in, on Instagram and was just like, hey, I heard you're looking for a fight. I'll fight you. And I just said, so, quit selling, boy. You're sold. Let's go. What did you tell? Did you uh, say anything to Nazareth after the fight? I know you, went, you both went through kind of similar situations getting here. And now he, he, like, I just went up, yeah, thanks for the fight, bud. Um, and then he was like, hey, I thought we were going to throw down. Like, what's... You, you're a wrestler now. You're going to throw it down. I said, you're, you're having a go at me. You're staring at me for five minutes waiting on me, and now you're giving me shit for... For taking you down, I was I was just giving you a taste of your own medicine, but that's all that was. Dan, to your right over here, uh, you know Nick Diaz is coming back tonight, and I know you've expressed interest in fighting him and Nate. You know before this fight, Nate in the building, you want to try and set that up now? Um, I feel like it's chasing unicorns, like chase, uh, waiting for that fight. Like um, to be honest, my priority is the title. Like um, if a, if that fight came to fruition, I would 100%. Uh, take that fight, but m my eyes are firmly fixed on the title. Like anything that comes outside of that can come, but um, man, that 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 gold belt around my waist, like that is, um, there ain't nothing that's gonna stop me from getting my hands on it. Was it kind of nicer to be lower on a card rather than like a main event or in a really high-profile spot in terms of like the pressure tonight? Um, pressure, pressure. For me, is, is I'm under as much pressure as I put myself under. Like, I don't feel any uh, external pressure. I feel like I, <laughs> if I put pressure on myself, I feel pressure. Um, but whether you, whether you put me in a pub in Auckland with 10 people there or whether you put me in the main event of a pay-per-view, like, you're going to get it. I'm going to fight um, 
the same way that I fight. Congrats, Dan. Thank you. Dan, Dan right over here. Uh, you, uh, <laughs> uh, you're the reaction of your country to the pandemic, I was wondering what your general overall re, uh, thoughts were to that, especially when you come over here and you're fighting in front of a crowd of about 17,000 people and most aren't wearing masks. <clears throat> Oh, brother, I'm a cage fighter. Like, that's uh, my, my, um, my political expertise and, and my, uh, <laughs> my, uh, fifth form, my fifth form science, 70% uh, or 60% in fifth form science is probably not, uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not educated enough on the topic to give a, a public statement. You know, I can just, I can just speak from my personal experience, um, where it's impacting me pretty hard in, in the way that I train and the way that I fight. So rather than sit on my hands and complain about it, I'm, I'm working through it, I'm pushing through it, and I'm going to continue to chase my dreams. Um, after the fight, you had uh, words of praise for your opponent, Nasrat, and you know you went through a lot of adversity getting here, and then you said you know, it didn't even get up to the level of what he went through. How important was that for you to give him his due while you are there in the octagon? Yeah, I just wanted to, um, because that's just the fact of the situation, like losing a mother is something that I've never experienced, so it's something that I can't, I can't even comprehend what he's going through to get here, or what he went through to get here, um, so it's very difficult for, for me, like, what, training in my garage compared to losing, my, losing a mother, like, that's, <laughs> that's incomparable, um, what he went through to get here should really get a lot of credit and a lot of respect. I feel like he's, he's a talented young kid. I feel like he's got a massive future uh, in the sport. It was just a bit much too soon, but he'll learn from it. He'll grow. He'll come back. And I'm sure, he, I'm sure um, we'll see each other again in the future. What words did you share with them? Uh, besides giving each other shit after the fight, that was, uh, <laughs> that was all it really was. Like, I'm sure we'll, we'll talk again or I'll see him around and catch up and, and have a proper conversation. But. Congrats. Dan in the middle. Uh, Israel Adesanya had said that he was not going to fight uh, again in his home country because of how you were treated. Have you talked to him about that? And, and how do you feel about his, his uh, demonstrative uh, statement? I can definitely see where he's coming from. I can definitely see um, he's speaking from the heart. He's, he's upset about the situation. And I feel like, I feel like, the powers that be show their true colors. I feel like um, I feel like Sport New Zealand. I feel like the big wigs and the media back home in New Zealand. They've just kind of been playing nice with us because we've been getting so much attention for the country. They've been playing along, playing nice of us, and then they saw opportunity to to put a lid on us or put a cap on us, and they showed their true colors of what they really wanted to do, which was stop MMA and the UFC getting massive in New Zealand, but it's a part of New Zealand culture. Combat sports is a part of our DNA in New Zealand, and we're going to push through no matter what. So when I say that, yeah, I'm, I'm willing to come over here and um, move to the States to continue. It's not because I want to move away from New Zealand or, or take anything away from New Zealand. No, I want to keep the ball rolling for New Zealand. I want to keep the ball rolling for my people. I don't want to just go back home and, and stay in my house and shut up and stay quiet and do what they want me to do, which is not, not train, not fight, sit on my hands, shut my gym down, um, and not continue to grow the sport in New Zealand. No, I'm not going to take that. I'm going to continue to train. I'm going to continue to fight. I'm going to continue to make sure that the UFC and MMA in New Zealand has a massive future and it's not going anywhere. So the powers that be... In the, in the way that I say that can kiss my ass because we are not going anywhere. We are a sport. We are a part of New Zealand culture and it's going to be there for a very long time. 